to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host McGee Dam and today we're going to be talking about 45, written by various writers in fact, as this is one of the few anthology series in the Big Finish's monthly range. Basically every once in a while the Big Finish would do a an anthology story. Usually they are referred to as like a story title and then and other stories. And essentially what they do is, just like in most um, Doctor Who stories, they would pair four episodes together. However, here it's more in line with each story being an individual, each episode being its own individual story, and the release, the actual uh, CDs themselves, would be interconnected by a similar theme, with this one being the number 45, which would play a part in the... The last story, I believe it's called The Word Lords. Uh, now, I haven't actually listened to this story yet. Um, I, as some of you might remember in my Keys and Marinus video, uh, when it comes to these anthology releases, what I usually do is um, I record uh, a segment for each story as a whole, and at the end I conclude the actual adventure. Um, and I, so I actually have no idea what this, this release entails, whether it's good or bad. Um, this is uh, the second story that I own, though it's not the second story overall, to feature Hex, played by Philippa Oliver, who became a new companion in, at least in my point of view, the last story, The Harvest. Now, for those of you who aren't too familiar with Big Finish, specifically the Seventh Doctor era. Um, the Hex stuff is apparently um, really heavy on the story arc, um, something which I've uh, done my research on. However, I don't have every release, so um, and I don't know how important this is into the, the release in order. So uh, there might be some details here which I might consider a plot hole, or bits I don't like, which are actually explained in other adventures. Though, as I've stated before in my Harvest video, I think it's a very poor way to structure a story if you need another story to understand its plot points. Hopefully, um, I can be okay without them, but if it relies on you listening to other stories, then, like, what's the point, honestly? Um, Two things I want to note about before I actually get into the stories. One is that on the official CD cover, uh, if you look inside the TARDIS, it's actually the 1996 um, interior, um, which was introduced in the TV movie. And I've stated many times uh, with my friends and just Doctor Who fans that I talk with, that the TV movie is my favourite TARDIS interior. I absolutely love it. From its gothic setting, to the colour scheme, to the wooden panelling. Just everything about it really screams time traveller. And uh, it really suits the Doctor's um, almost Victorian personality and his traits, in a way. Um, and the second thing I want to note, which is actually uh, listed on the, DVD, on the CD, uh, cover is that it features um, an actor who'd become very big after the release of this story. It features Benedict Cumberbatch, who would be later known for playing Sherlock Holmes in the TV show Sherlock. So this is the official uh, Big Finish CD cover, which is really nice. And like always, I printed my own DVD cover. Uh, so there you go. Uh, that's the spine, if anyone's interested. And this is the back, which I've stolen from somebody from DeviantArt. I actually put that together because I didn't like the cover I found. But um, the back I was happy with, so I stole that. So anyway, let's move on to the first story. So the first story in this uh, anthology is called The False Gods, written by Mark Morris, which sees... Um, the character, or at least the historical figure, of Howard Carter, a famous archaeologist who was well known for looking into Egyptian tombs. And um, later on in life, from this story's perspective, he found, 
think it was King Tumra, Tumra someone's tomb, uh, which is one of the most well documented um, um, pharaohs in existence, thanks to Howard Carter. Now this is the role that Benedict Cumberbatch plays, and um, he does a very good job here. Um, the story starts off by showing that there's something wrong with time. Um, the Doctor, Ace and Hex are basically crashing in the TARDIS, and Hex seems to be um, having some time-sensitive abilities as he can start hearing voices, as he can feel that something is amiss with time. And the Doctor basically quickly works out. And he's also decided that um, the TARDIS has landed in Egypt uh, during the 1900s, where Howard Carter is um, examining a tomb of a particular pharaoh, trying to look for these amazing artefacts that were suggested to him by his assistant, Jane. Um, and, yeah, the story mainly has um, the Doctor um, and Hex uh, meeting Howard Carter and examining this tomb as Ace and Jane uh, get a caught up in some sort of shenanigans outside as, thanks to uh, the time interference around this area, we see um, creatures from the dawn of time and a robot um, from the future interact with the present day. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's got a lot of uh, things going for it. Uh, to see the Doctor and Hex get a lot of scenes together really helps with this, um, with their dynamic, helping them push the, their stories further. I'm glad to announce that um, the first part, anyway, doesn't have any heavy ties to any of the stories so far. Um, as I've stated before, everything that connects this story with the other stories in this anthology release is the number 45. And in here, um, inside the tomb, um, Howard Carter had discovered 45 uh, ornaments, 45 pieces of interest inside the tomb. However, after the time uh, shenanigans happen, um, they, they recounted and it's 44. One of them has gone missing. Um, something doesn't seem right with Jane as Ace kind of picks up stuff. Um, she mentioned something about the ozone layer, which um, people in the 1900s shouldn't really know by then. Um, and she doesn't seem to be too freaked out by the fact that there's a robot. She's a little bit freaked out, but she seemed to be taking it extraordinarily well. Um, as the Doctor is dealing with Hex and Howard, and uh, they're getting attacked by a creature during some time around about the dawn of time, or at least for Earth anyway, a prehistoric uh, creature that's trying to attack them inside the tomb. But they're struggling to get out as they're trapped and that the stone is really weak. The doctor theorizes because of the time uh, weakening around them that it will fade away as quickly as it appeared. Um, so yeah, the, the groups are split into two. Uh, the males and the girls. Um, but the boys, you've got the doctor, Hex and Howard. And they work off each other extremely well. I like how normal Hex and Howard are uh, compared to usual characters in Doctor Who. Uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, you can tell that it's his voice, but man, he does a fantastic job of bringing out this character. Sadly, he doesn't get a lot to do, um, apart from really the ending. Mostly it's him just going like, what's happening, Doctor? I don't understand. Um, thing. There's a great bit where Hex starts throwing ornaments at the creature, but um, Howard stops him by saying, these are priceless artifacts. They must be preserved. They must be kept to understand history as we know it. But the doctor intervenes 
by saying that the ornaments, throwing the ornaments would basically do nothing. And what they need to do is go into the tomb even further uh, and just wait until the creature dissipates. Um, so yeah, and on Ace's point of view, uh, she's gone outside with Jane and uh, something happens and the sun starts changing colour and the dig which Howard Carter was um, expositing uh, completely disappears as if it wasn't there or it hasn't been there for a while. As Ace basically clicks that they have travelled into the distant future. Uh, but Jane has something up her sleeve. Uh, she says to a robot that comes up to him and threatens to kill them if they don't prove any identification of them telling the truth. Because Jane is like, right, I've got something in my bag, something which I need to show you. And she takes out a key and they find the missing ornament which Howard Carter had found, the, the 45th ornament. And he asks, she asks Ace to put the key inside the, the ornament's mouth, to which it's revealed it's a TARDIS. Uh, in fact, Jane is in fact a Time Lord, a student that got trapped on Earth with a few other students um, who sadly didn't make it. And they basically became, um, in this particular story, the Egyptian gods. Um, I can't remember the exact tale, but um, part of the mythos is that um, one of the gods got tricked to, uh, to basically go into the sun, um, creating a massive pulse of energy which would change the Earth's rotation, which is why millions of years ago it was uh, the sun acted completely different to the way it is now. Um, so basically it's this we get introduced to a new Time Lord here with Jane and I do really like this character. She's basically like the meddling monk only there is no hint of bad um, uh, bad ideologies in there. She literally is there by mistake and she just wants to get back home without um, being prosecuted in a way. There's no malicious intent intended um, and basically they get into the TARDIS to try and rescue the Doctor, Hex and Howard and they do and they get into the TARDIS um, and the Doctor when he gets there he can sense that this TARDIS is extraordinarily old and in fact it is so old that the, the interior has deteriorated and is actually absorbing some of the energy of the Doctor's TARDIS because it's been so neglected and it actually appears on the inside as an exact replica of the Seventh Doctor's TARDIS, which is, um, according to the cover, is the, uh, the 1996 TV movie. And the Doctor basically persuades Jane, it's like, right, uh, what you're doing is wrong, it's horrible, um, we're gonna have to, uh, your TARDIS is the reason why all these time travel and shenanigans are happening in the first place. So what we're going to do is we're going to, you are going to take your TARDIS into the sun and I am going to rescue you at the last minute to save you and then we're going to take you back to Gallifrey where you will stand trial for your shenanigans. Though she kind of realises it's like, if I go back to Gallifrey, they're going to prosecute me and they're going to disintegrate me possibly, most likely. But uh, she agrees and she starts flying into the heart of the star. However, she tries to actually escape by traveling back in time. And the doctor starts panicking. He's like, no, Jane! Like, uh, do you know, like he famously screams Ace. Speaking of Ace, um, in my previous video about um, the relationship between the doctor and Ace in which Ace now doesn't refer to herself as Ace because of something that happens in the New Adventure novels. It appears I am wrong about that, as she now refers to herself as Ace for the majority of this story anyway. Whether that uh, continues throughout the rest of the audio drama, I'm not quite sure. 
and um, the doctor starts panicking. He tries his very best to try and rescue you, but Ace persuades Hex to press a particular button on the TARDIS, which would set him back onto Earth. And there's a really great moment where the TARDIS lands back on Earth, and Hex is like, um, I'm sorry, Doctor, I got to do it. To which um, the Doctor shouts at Hex. It's like, do you know what you've done, Mr. Hex? I could have saved her. I could have rescued her. To which Howard Carter um, proclaims, probably not. You said that she's gone back in time. Remember the law of the gods and that um, the mythology of the gods that this particular god, which was supposed to represent uh, Jane, um, got tricked into falling into the sun, which would create the um, the Earth's rotation to shift into what we would now know it. And there was no way to rescue her. This was her destiny, in a sense, um, which kind of saddens the Doctor that basically she was destined to die, and it was such a tragedy of life. And so the story ends with um, the Doctor and Howard um, talking about like the rules of, of time travel and heck, and Howard is like, um, we can learn so much about the past, but none of us can know anything about our futures. And there you go, that's um, The False Gods. Um, pretty good story, it's a bit short, it's a bit weak on some places. Sometimes it does feel a bit of a rushed. Uh, an example, a great example would be when Jane is like, no, I'm not going to do it. I can't risk my TARDIS. It's the only way I can get back home without, um, without people knowing I've been messing with time. And then the next scene, she's completely fine and tries to go into the... Or at least she seemingly is fine to go with the Doctor's plan of sending it into the sun whilst the Doctor rescues her and sends her to Gallifrey. Um, but it's a very strange um, twist like that. Um, Howard Carter's um, exact uh, role in the story could come off as could literally could be any other character. It didn't have to be Howard Carter or any. Um, it could literally be any um, um, archaeologist. Um, but to hear Benedict come back in a Doctor Who role. Uh, is just so fantastic. If I could be wrong, but I believe um, during this story he was actually uh, making Sherlock and Big Finish allowed him time to take breaks, uh, longer breaks than usual so he could go and film Sherlock season one. So that's really, really cool. Um, something which I didn't note in the opening of this video because I've only now just discovered this. This um, release is actually the 45th anniversary of Doctor Who. Um, so there, take that as you will. Um, yeah. <laughs> so um, there you go, on to the next story. So the next story on our list is Order of Simplicity, written by Mark Shrovel. Now, Mark Shrovel uh, is a very interesting man. This is actually his only written work for Doctor Who, that, um, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but he's mostly known for his acting work. Specifically, he's known for playing an incarnation of the Doctor in some uh, fan-made stage productions and some fan films. So that's a, that's a really cool... Uh, background information about this adventure. The story sees the Doctor, Ace and Hex um, entering a spooky like castle from the distant future where the Doctor has gone to meet um, a bioengineer known as Doctor Verneman who has given out this code into the vast universe and has asked anybody to try and solve it. And the Doctor, despite not actually solving it, uh, seized the code and was compelled to go and meet Verneman, to which um, basically the story plays out as a kind of um, Frankenstein homage as we got the spooky rain in the background 
Um, we've got this creepy assistant, um, this woman maid who helps uh, Dr. Verneman with the uh, tea and coffee. Um, interestingly, the doctor asks Hex, who is a bit of a coward. The story really influences the 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 character of Hex. He's a bit of a coward. He's a normal man. Um, he has a fear of basements, an unnatural fear of basements and anything spooky related. Um, but he still is enthralled in the adventure. Though he, if he had his way, he wouldn't really be there for the dangerous part. If that makes any sense. And so the doctor asks him to help um, the maid. I believe her name is like Miss Trips, Crisps. Or something like that to help her with the tea and so from Hex's point of view Hex um, is actually in the story for the majority of the plot in this a small little one episode by himself again I really love the dynamic they keep switching it around um, of this three TARDIS crew usually you get like two characters that keep getting paired up and sometimes that can become a bit stale um, but from my experience, Hex is always like mixing and mashing with different um, character groups. And it's really interesting to see him um, uh, basically trying to, uh, secretly in a way, trying to confront his fears. And is um, always like, oh, I'm going to regret, I'm going to regret this. As he, um, as he is obliged to help with uh, making the the coffee to try and get some information from the maid. And Doctor and Ace uh, talk to uh, Verneman and basically he's explained in his recent project he's learned a way to enhance the human brain to a point where the IQ level skyrockets up to unfathomable levels. And uh, he's basically gone completely insane. He's gone absolutely mad. He just wants to convert everybody he he meets into a a genius which Ace is absolutely terrified by but the doctor's kind of like 50-50 until um, the doctor and Ace are like what's this got to do with the code that you sent out? What's this got to do? And Verneman explains that there's something mysterious about the code, something which uh, you've already worked out, Doctor, but it's on the tip of your tongue. And the Doctor kind of is like, I don't understand, there's something terrifying about this code, I can't put my mind onto it. There's something odd, there's something strange, and I feel quite strange, quite weary. And it sort of clicks that this code isn't a code at all, it's a virus. A virus that lowers the IQ of anyone that reads it to 45. Putting the whole um, 45 theme in the anthology again. Um, and the doctor's basically infected and it was him reading this that was compelling him to come to this castle. And Verneman is basically like, is like, right, you've got to use this my machine to enhance your intelligence so we can find a solution to the code, to complete the code so that it doesn't infect any more people. And if so, if you don't succeed, oh well, there will be other people who would come out and um, more people who would come who would read the code and be compelled here. Which Ace is just utterly baffled by. It's like, you're completely insane. You're completely mad. Now, I don't think it's stated anywhere in this story. I couldn't hear any references to this. However, according to the TARDIS wiki, the official Doctor Who Wikipedia page, this is actually one of the viruses seen in Patient Zero, in which um, the Vervans, for, is that the Ver I can't remember what they called, the Virons, the Virons is the one, but the Virons are collecting all of these viruses throughout time and space that were collected in this, um, this secret base which we've seen in Patient Zero. So, nice little continuity there, there. I can't remember them actually referencing this specifically. Maybe that's mentioned in a different story somewhere. But, uh, yeah, it makes a nice little nod 
to those adventures, even though it doesn't play any part to it. And the Doctor is like, right, I'm going to have to use um, this machine. Um, back at the Hex's point of view, um, basically the, the, the mistress, the stewardess, is like, I'm not an idiot. The Doctor didn't send you to me to make the tea. You want to get information. What information are you after? And Hex is like, uh, you're not just a major, aren't you? You're something more to um, Professor Verman. I need to know the truth. And she basically tells him to go to the third uh, room on the third floor. And she kind of leaves him to give the tea to the other characters. Hex, um, we get one of his moments where he's absolutely terrified. He really doesn't want to go. But um, he talks to himself. He's like, I'm going to regret this as he goes up to the room and what he finds are these cavemen-like individuals who are intelligence have become um, 245 and they're basically like uh, savages and when Hex is there trying to help them the door slams shut behind them as the mistress character is like uh, basically revealed to be like a sort of the villain of the piece. And so the doctor puts himself into the code, uh, into the, the smart machine to enhance his intelligence. But he figures out something about the code. The solution is not to complete the code. If he completes the code, the code would become airborne. And people who would even come near anybody infected would also become infected. You wouldn't need to read the code to become infected with this virus and so the solution is not to to figure it out if so uh people would become extraordinarily stupid however it's revealed that um the maid again i think her name is miss miss crisp or something like that um held everybody in the situation at gunpoint after she tells them that hex is dying and ace runs off. Um, the doctor soon tries to follow, but the mistress is like, get back in the machine and figure out the code. And she reveals that she is part of a secret cult known as the Order of Simplicity, who believe that technology and these geniuses have actually ruined and decreased the, the nature of humanity and is trying to lower their intelligence to not understand technology. So that humans can be more with one with nature in that kind of capacity. And the doctor is shocked by this. He's completely baffled by the, just the idiot um, thrall. However, the doctor being infected is slowly becoming an idiot as the virus has taken its effect. But the doctor has a plan as he actually lowers his IQ to 45 which allows him to be psychically connected with the other people uh, in the top floor who actually break out and um, capture uh, Miss Crisp. And the Doctor actually puts himself brain dead for a while until Hex, being an A&E nurse, revives him. And the Doctor basically explains that what happened was is that he actually lowered his IQ so that his intelligence... Uh, so that the virus cannot feed off his intelligence and the psychic connection pushed the any information the doctor had about the the code into the people who IQ was 45 basically disintegrating the virus uh, curing the doctor and um, Dr. Vermin uh, and when the doctor revives um, everything is back to normal and so uh, that's the order of simplicity. Um, it's a pretty decent story. I really love the atmosphere, the Frankenstein kind of feel of it. The the imagery of haunted castles and the storm uh, in the distance and the, with the rain outside. It's a great sound track, and um, I like Hex's um, little subplot. Um, Ace, I think is the weaker link in this story. She doesn't get a lot to do apart from having some nice little quirky moments. Uh, to see the Doctor become an idiot is a very great uh, moment. I think it's a bit weak on plot, but it's 
it's um, it's one episode of an anthology four-parter. So it's basically one fourth of a usual uh, classic Doctor Who story. So I don't blame it in that capacity. But it's a nice little sound sound scope. It's it's fun. That's the best way to describe this story. It's not amazing. It's not great. It's not something which we will be thinking about for years to come. But it's fun and enjoyable. So there you go. So on to the third adventure. So the third story, Casualties of War, written by Mark Mishkowski, um, is a very strange one for an anthology story. After it's been set after two stories which have been very self-contained, this story is really heavy on other story arcs, uh, specifically two. Um, one's being Ace's character, and another one to revolve in around an organisation, which we'll get onto in a bit. But it's very strange. It's, I'm absolutely baffled by the fact that the third episode of an anthology four-parter just all of a sudden is like one of the most, like, I wouldn't say important, but one of the most connected stories in the franchise. It's really strange like that. The Doctor lands the TARDIS in 1945, which is where the 45 comes in in this story, which didn't actually become clear to me until I locked it up on the internet, um, because I'm a colossal idiot, on VE Day. Now, one thing I thought was really stupid in this story, it's a little, like, runaway line, Hex doesn't know what VE Day is. He's from the year 2021. This year, yeah. But, I don't know, that's just really bizarre that he doesn't know a V day, one of the most important day in human history. It's just, I don't know, something about that just really feels off uh, to me. And they're trying to track down some alien technology. We hear um, there's a scene in which this guy, he's been using this bracelet to basically mind control people into telling the truth. Uh, this guy comes up for him, basically blackmailing him, and what he does then is use this bracelet to get this guy to tell him um, that he's a gambler, and the guy with the bracelet, I can't remember his name, I think his name, his name is Johnny or something, um, he's like, right, you keep my secrets, and I might keep your secrets, so we've got a little partnership there, we've got something going. Uh, but the Doctor's trying to track down this alien technology, and he tracks it to a Pacific house. A house that's familiar to Ace, as this is her old house, the house her mother used to live in. Um, as we get introduced to um, Ace's um, great-grandmother, in a way, and um, Ace's mother was now uh, in a form of a little girl, which we previously seen as a baby in The Curse of Fendrick. So this story actually follows up from the storyline in The Curse of Fendrick, where Ace, um, in that story, she has an un... Um, we basically learn that Ace has this un... Um, unreasonable hatred for her mother, but learns to love this baby which she didn't realise was her mother and when she found out it was her mother it kind of shocked her and, and terrified her that uh, she could actually love her mom, mother in a way. Um, and in that story it kind of gets resolved that, um, that she can learn to love and appreciate her mother and in this story um, the dynamic is kind of resurrected as this little girl and Ace's relationship is um, kind of like a mixed bag. Ace seems to be a lot more friendly with, um, with I believe her name is Audrey, um, Ace's mother. And Audrey seems to be like nicely bouncing off, some, uh, off Ace and the other characters. Although the actress who plays her, um, they gave her like, like a kid's voice and they kind of altered the the uh, the sound of her voice to make her sound like a kid, but it really doesn't work. 
and it makes her sound like a robot in certain scenes. Um, and Ace is basically left um, uh, in the house to investigate as they basically discover that this guy who's been stealing alien technology is actually um, Ace's mother's uncle, who uh, who's actually a thief and is going to basically use his technology to um, blackmail other people. Uh, the Doctor learns that it's faulty and so him and X have got to go on the run to try and find this guy. Um, uh, but there's also a third party involved, one that's also trying to get the bracelet to, um, to power their, their strength and their thing as they research and capture alien technology so that they could one day control the world. This organisation is known as The Forge. And for those of you who don't know, The Forge is a recurring organisation that appears in multiple Seventh Doctor adventures. I believe they are in some Six Doctors. This is one of the whole story arc heavy plot elements which I was worried about. I didn't know they were in this story when I found out um, when the Doctor is like, oh no, it's the Forge! Um, and Hex is like, but Doctor, you told me before. Not now, Hex. Uh, so basically, they've had an encounter with the Forge before, or at least in some capacity, at least the Doctor has, where Hex and Ace may not have been involved um, in the main plot of an adventure. I believe they've appeared before, release-wise, in a story called No Man's Land. But I could be wrong there. Um, and they're basically, essentially, they're basically Torchwood uh, during um, the 19th century, in a sense. Um, and they're a lot more sinister and a lot more villainous compared to Torchwood. They're basically the evil version of Torchwood. Before Torchwood, it is even a thing. Actually, I think this came out in, this came out in 2008. So... I don't know what was like the influence. Maybe the Forge was influenced by Torchwood. I mean, like in real life now. And they also are after the technology. Um, a group of them go into Ace's mother's house where they knock Ace unconscious and steal all of the alien equipment that, um, that this character has been taken and basically ransacked his room. Whilst this character's on the run and still has the bracelet. And the Doctor and Hex actually catch up to them. Um, and this character basically forces them to tell the truth. And he learns that um, Audrey is Ace's mother. It's like, what? I don't understand. How is this possible in this freak? Um, he tries to get Hex to uh, tell him his relationship to them whether it's like their family or something. But without even saying a word, uh, this character works out that Hex um, isn't Ace's boyfriend, but he'd like to be. He fancies, at the most, at the least, he fancies Ace. At the most, he's in love with her. Um, so that kind of is like a small revelation in a way that he kind of fancies Ace. Um, he did fancy Ace in The Harvest, however I think this scene implies that there's a lot more feelings there, that he um, he likes her more than just a little, ooh, let's have a little snog and, and that's it kind of way. Like he wants to be in a relationship with her in some sense and capacity. And then we get another story hark heavy moment, a moment which did kind of distract me of this story in a way. But I also understand that it's part of a larger uh, plot thread, something which is actually carried over from the harvest in which this character uh, tries to get the Doctor to explain who Hex is. And the Doctor is struggling, he's trying to keep himself, he's trying to keep a secret as he's, the Doctor's like, Hex's mother is, Hex's mother is, no I can't say, Hex's mother is is um i believe hex doesn't actually know who his mother actually is 
um, uh, luckily um, the forge come in and infiltrate the place before the doctor can tell this secret about uh, Hex. But really, that scene really felt like, hey everybody, this is going to be important in a later adventure. Which, um, if it was in the if it's in the last story, in the last episode of this anthology, I would be completely fine with. Uh, maybe it's actually confronted in the next story. I don't know, but I know for a fact that this revelation is takes place in a later story, which I do luckily have. But I ju it's just really distracting, in my opinion, and I really didn't like that kind of tease in a way. Um, and the Forge just kind of appear and take um, the technology, but because it's broken and this character's been using it so much, it's kind of backfired onto him and he can never tell a lie ever again. His brain, he's basically, I wouldn't say like a cabbage, but his intelligence has gone a little bit lower and now he has the inability to, he doesn't have the ability anymore to lie. He cannot lie. Um, to which the doctor has to explain to his mother, Ace's great grandmother. Um, and Hex and Ace actually have a discussion about how important mothers are. And so Ace goes up to the bedroom to say um, goodbye to Audrey. Uh, Hex then talks with the doctor about, um, about how. Could you know anything about my mother? Which kind of implies that Hex um, is kind of adopted, perhaps. Um, but the Doctor tries to hide the fact. Um, he's like, ah, well, mm, uh, well, well, well. But Hex is like, um, um, I don't understand. Clearly you were lying because you don't know anything about my mother. But how could you lie when that machine forced us to tell the truth? Unless it's a Time Lord thing, of course, it must be a Time Lord thing. Um, very clever of you, Doctor. And the Doctor's like, yeah, <laughs> yes, well, uh, uh, I work in mysterious ways. Um, implying that that um, the Doctor's trying to keep this a secret about um, Hex's parentage from, uh, from him. Again, another very heavy story arc moment, which... If it doesn't get resolved in the next story in the anthology, I would, I'm would i going to heavily criticise that as a really distracting plot point in this um, anthology. So that's um, Casualty of War. Um, overall, I think it's a jumble of mess. It relies too much on the audience, understanding what's going on. There's bits to just tease for next stories and stuff as if um, the audience are like, oh my god, I can't wait for how to happen in the next one. Kind of um, stuff which I'm personally not a fan of. If you like that kind of stuff, then go ahead, enjoy this story. But for me, it wasn't for me. And I also felt that this story being a one part long in an anthology really undermines this plot. We had some really great moments with um, Ace and Audrey. We got um, a great dynamic between um, a audio exclusive villain, The Forge. But because it's only in one episode, it feels really rushed and it feels really like the ideas couldn't bubble in a, uh, in a very satisfying way. It's entertaining as hell. I mean, a lot, of just, it seems like a lot of like shoved in moments, but it does feel like a four-parter shoved into a one-part adventure for the sake of fitting it in this anthology. So I would kind of say this story is a bit of a dud. So now on to the final story in the anthology. So, the final story, The Word Lord, written by Stephen Hall, um, concludes this adventure and actually connects the stories all up with the 45 um, reference. The story actually begins with the Doctor, Ace and Hex already um, caught. Um, 
they're in this top secret military base in the year 2045 in which um, all these ambassadors of all these different countries are in this secret base where uh, it's one of the most top secret bases to the point where not even germs can even um, get into the base. Um, however, one of the ambassadors actually got murdered in his room um, and nobody knows how and with the doctor just appearing with his TARDIS um, he's obviously becomes the first suspect. However, after a woman interrupts, um, basically is like, um, you're complete, we know you're completely innocent, Doctor. Um, I work for UNIT and I know you by your reputation, so um, you can help us um, with everything. We have like, the top um, in terms of every like information around the base. We've got cameras um, um, in all places. And they also state as well that the secret base is so secret that there's not even allowed to have any books. There's only one book in the entire facility, um, which is actually like the, the rule book for this base and what you've got to do and everything. And the doctor is trying to study all of the, um, all of the dialogue, all of this, what's happening, until he notices a certain pattern. Uh, one character um, um, in the, the recordings makes a little joke about snowballs and the number 45. And the Doctor notices something strange as during the recordings, all of a sudden, at every like two nanoseconds, loads of characters, including ones of himself and all the characters in the room, start mentioning the word 45 as if something is kind of like imprinting itself into the reality and Hex is really freaked out by this and is like um, Doctor, that's kind of weird but what does it mean? Now personally, I don't know about you but for me it reminded me a lot of the Bad Wolf scenario. Um, it does then beg the question, did the Ninth Doctor suspect that the Bad Wolf could be linked with the same villain as this story. It would have been a very interesting thought. Um, and the Doctor kind of actually already knows the answer um, of what this 45 even means. Basically, uh, it is the launch pad of an engine. An engine to a cordis. Basically, um, in a dimension uh, which is actually described 45 dimensions away from our reality, um, exists a universe where instead of matter and existence, there's only language and the written page. And in this universe, instead of time lords, we have word lords, um, who are basically gods in their reality. And one of them... Um, one that's named Nobody Nobody, Nobody, No One Nobody um, has actually come to this dimension and basically what he does is um, he takes out people in a way which might be an endanger to the multiverse and he actually um, is also a bounty hunter who's up to the Doctor's head to give to the Daleks and to the Cybermen. Um, the Doctor, trying to keep everybody safe, uh, tells Ace to bring all of the Ambassadors into the TARDIS. And when the Doctor tries to work out that, that it is a Word Lord that's getting involved in all this, he tells Ace to try and place a button at the bottom of the TARDIS console. But when she tries to, uh, tries to do it, there's actually a hatch that's blocking the, the button so she can't place it. And suddenly a man appears. Nobody, no one. Um, according to the Wikipedia page, um, his personality is based off the Doctor's 10th incarnation, or the 11th incarnation, depending on what your point, uh, point is. The David Tennant in incarnation. Um, not that he like, sounds like him, but he has the same like inflictions, the same kind of 
well, kind of personality traits. Um, and he basically is this overpowered entity. Um, in a really horrific scene, he starts, he shoots um, three of the delegates and Ace is shouting at him and is like, you evil bugger, you kill these people, you kill these innocent people and for what? Why did you do it? And he explains that basically that, you know, why not? He, he gets bored very easily. He's just someone who can't be controlled, who can't be contained. A soldier then starts trying to fire at him, but his gun is um, locked. And uh, the word lord explains they're in a, uh, in a state of temporal flux. A reference to the hand of fear in which no weapons can be fired inside the TARDIS. However, the word lord being from a completely different dimension, the laws of physics don't actually apply to him, which allows him to shoot the, the soldier. Now, the word lord is such a fascinating villain. I really enjoyed this performance. Um, he is absolutely fascinated by Ace, who actually talks back to him. And he's like, it's been so long since somebody talked back to me. Next thing you know, you're going to tell me to stop killing these men. Go on, I dare you. Tell me to stop killing. To which he continues to shoot people. And Ace is just helpless, but she's absolutely thrall. She's absolutely uh, mad. And Hex, um, during this over the radio, um, tries to get into the TARDIS to try and help Ace. But um, before that, the Doctor gives Hex a sort of like a futuristic crowbar to try and get into the hatch so they can press this uh, button underneath the TARDIS. Um, and the Doctor realises then that if anybody says nobody or the words no one, um, then nobody no one appears. Um, and he then, uh, that's like how he enters into our reality. And uh, the Doctor accidentally says it and puts the Word Lord into the room with him and Claire. Um, and he talks to the Word Lord and is trying to, to work out what his deal is. To which he learns his, this whole um, idea of the multiverse. And that he's also, as well, a crude bounty hunter. Um, he has a deal with the Daleks to bring back the Doctor dead. Um, he also knows the Cybermen are also paying for the Doctor, um, but specifically only his brain. So, uh, in a very quirky moment, he's like, um, my plan is, is to kill you, take out your brain, surgically remove it so the Daleks don't know, and then everyone's happy. Well, except for you, because you would be dead, of course. <laughs> um, and that's pretty cool. And then, um, uh, the Doctor is like, talking to him, constantly talking to him, until he reveals that basically the Doctor's trying to be distracting to him whilst Hex tries to open the hatch. Um, he tries opening it, but he has no idea how this ranch thing works. It's a, like a futuristic thing with different settings and stuff. Um, Hex later works out that it's um, the setting 45 is the right one, but um, the Doctor... He's talking to the Word Lord and is like, um, you don't know when you've been distracted. Now, Hex! Hex! Hex, now! Press the button now! And the Word Lord is like, um, you're a complete imbecile and shoots the Doctor dead. Only he didn't. As Claire got into the way and she basically revealed just before she dies that she actually met a Doctor a doctor from uh, presumably the future incarnation. She says it's like a grumpy um, elderly man. Um, but I think in the way it's performed, I think it's a slight hint that this is actually a future incarnation. This is my head, this is a head canon uh, by me. Because she states that the doctor that she met when she was a little girl, um, to which the doctor doesn't remember. Uh, possibly because it's from his future, uh, told her the importance of fear and that fear is this 
um, amazing thing that she should be proud of. Doesn't that sound familiar? It sounds similar to the Twelfth Doctor's speech about fear in the story Listen. So in my head canon, um, it was the Twelfth Doctor that met Claire as a little girl. Um, obviously that couldn't be the fact in terms of what the writer was thinking because this story came out in 2008. But it's a very interesting idea and a very interesting thought. Um, as these characters are distracted by the fact that Claire is dying, does um, Hex finally get to the button and presses it? And what this does is, is actually this button is actually to turn off the TARDIS translation circuit so that nobody can speak any other language. And this uh, basically traps the word lord in a sense in a place where uh, the only written word in any near earth um, capacity which would be the rule book so the doctor's basically trapped him there and it's basically it's like um, don't read the book because he might be free again and, and nobody say his name if anybody says his name he can get free um, and the story kind of ends on a cliffhanger as just before the doctor ace and hex leave um, the military who have been alerted to this because the politicians died early on in the story um, comes in and says nobody move releasing him and the doctor looks into the book where the pages are completely blank the word lord is out there he's free to create havoc and to meet up again making uh, the word lord one of the few returning villains um, exclusive to the audio dramas um, he was actually supposed to appear in three stories, but due to cost, he only appeared in two. This and a story which we will be tackling, uh, luckily. Um, and we actually have a post credit scene in which the Doctor, Ace and Hex enter the TARDIS, defeated. And the Doctor basically just states, it's like, um, I feel like having coffee, having something different for a change as the TARDIS sets off, flying. So there you go, that's the word lord. Uh, overall, I think it suffers from the same problem I had with Casualty of War in that it's way too short for the ideas that this story has. To introduce such a monumental, godlike entity and to have this whole um, 45 pattern thing and have this really creepy thing where this massive coincidence just sort of happens and it turns out to be fueled by an, an entity from a completely different dimension. Feels like a story which really should have been four parts long or at least longer than one part and I feel like uh, this along with the other story Casualty of War um, parts three and four in this anthology uh, suffered by the fact that they're in this and weren't really structured in a way that they adapt to the one episode format and the ideas were too much for a little adventure and it kind of feels bogged down um, and thin. But I prefer this over Casualty of War because there's not a lot of um, plot points which is like connected heavily to everything. Um, apart from the fact the story feels much shorter than it should be, it's actually a really good story. The uh, Word Lord is surprisingly a good, uh, interesting villain. Um, Ace has some really great dramatic moments, and so does the Doctor. Hex? This is actually the weakest Hex story so far. And um, we get some nice little character beats, even if those character beats are extremely short and could have been a lot better if they had more time to develop. So there you go, that's the anthology release, um, 45. Overall, I think it's a mixed bag. The first two stories, in which they are much more self-contained, feel very fitted to a one-episode format. But when we get to parts uh, three and four, um, do a lot of issues start struggling in. The stories are never boring, I'd like to add. There's always something interesting happening. It's just that 
um, when there's something interesting happening in, in the later adventures, it feels like, okay, that's interesting, right, on to the next bit, kind of, that kind of atmosphere. Um, so, I'm not too sure. Uh, personally, my favourite one was uh, the second story in which they go to the castle um, and they meet the mad scientist. But I think, I don't know, I say check it out if you're interested in this kind of thing. Uh, like I said, part three is very continuity heavy, so do remember to go into that um, and remember that it connects to the Ace's storyline in The Curse of Fendrick and the Forge part line that happens in throughout a bunch of audio dramas. Um, whether we see the Forge again, I have no idea because I haven't heard... This is actually the first time I've heard this story, these stories and this is the first time I'm listening to any of the Hex stories. So, there you go. So there you go, that's 45. So join me next time where the Doctor, Ace and Hex get caught up in a deadly cosmic game. So see you next time for The Magic Mousetrap. And I'll see you next time on The Doctor Who Marathon. ta -da.